Cap, hey Cap, wake up, wake up. What, another dream again? How'd I get it this time? Was I lynched in the Old West? Trampled by the bulls in Paplona? Splattered across the decontamination chamber? No, he fired disruptors at you. Then blew you off a cliff with his evil mind ray. <sighs> How many times are we going to go over this? You're going to have to see a counselor. That's all there is to it. No. I'm not seeing a shrink, and that's final. You have to get it through your head that I'm not going anywhere. You leave. You co-hosts always leave. Something new catches your eye, and soon I'm being taken for granted. It's easy to spot. That light in their eyes when they do the news for the first time. It fades. It all just fades away. I remember the first time Rogue and I walked onto the new set. It was like fireworks. Oh, my God. And Phil Bones, with that Aussie accent of his. Okay, Cap, any more of this, and I'm out of here. See? Look, I just came to see if we're ready for tonight's show. We got the conclusion to both Al's interview and Pendant Primetime, not to mention our guest, author of the week, Rogue Enterprise. Really? I almost forgot. How's my hair? Your hair's fine. Can we do this? Do I look fat in this? not recognize me, but I hold the record for the longest consecutive win streak in dueling history. Don't feel bad. It happens all the time. When I'm eating at my favorite restaurant or charging goods and services all over the Alpha Quadrant and beyond. Let's face it, there are some malevolent species out there and they just don't trust me. But they do trust this, the Andorian Express Card, known throughout the Quadrant as a symbol of prestige. It's not just a charge card. It's a status symbol that says, I'm somebody, and it's accepted on planets galaxy-wide. You may not be from my home world, but nothing says you've arrived like Andorian Express. Even when my opponents fail to realize what they're in for, it's easy to remind them. I'm Shrak, and I've taken the lives of 16 men, a career that screams excellence, just like my card, Andorian Express. Don't Ushan without it. And now, news. This week saw the release of the Cation Carrier on the Federation side for players. This carrier adds a new offensive power set to the Federation and has caused some issues with Klingon players as it removes the uniqueness of one of their abilities and gives it to both sides. Only time we'll see if this truly affects any real balance issues with the game, though, to be honest, I don't personally foresee any major problems myself. We also just had the Junior Officer Appreciation Weekend occur again, allowing players who didn't originally have the ability to get one of the unique Exocomp duty officers. It also saw the start of a rerun of the featured episode series for the Davidians, which has now been retitled Spectres for the series title. This allows players to also get the Ophidian Cane, sometimes called the Pimp Cane by some players, if they were not in-game originally to get it, or have created new characters since the last time this was run. Also, voting should be coming to an end shortly on the Foundry Challenge number 2. 
this challenge is for players to create a certain mission set based on the parameters given by Brandflakes earlier last month. So far, reaction for this Foundry challenge has been less than previously, but we will see if perhaps the third Foundry challenge will be better. Also, the month of May has been designated a Foundry Feature Month. This, among other things, has given rise to a blog post, which was featured on the Star Trek Online website and also on StarTrek.com, written by yours truly, as well as a continued support and recognition of Foundry authors. This includes the return of the feature spotlight for the Foundry, with the first user chosen for this being Ali Mac 30 with his mission The City of the Polmari. In time, my understanding is that we will see a return of the Foundry spotlight on a weekly basis, and it appears from initial reports that the return of the Foundry spotlight has increased significantly the playthroughs of Ali Mac's mission as of Saturday evening, He's increased his playthroughs by approximately 2,500 plays. And we're back with our third and final segment of Primetime UGC's exclusive interview with Star Trek Online's lead designer, Mr. Al Rivera. To lead off, I think an obvious question is, with a handle like Captain Gecko, I would imagine people would expect to see a Gorn. Uh, a Saurian is a bit of a surprise, even though they are reptilian. Is there a reason behind it? I love the ideas of Saurians from the beginning, and, and I mean, as, as my name implies, Gecko, the, the uh, classification of Gecko, I think it's the clash of the order of Geckos, is, is, Saur, is, is Saur, uh, Sauria. And mm -hmm. um, so uh, I and. and and I've, I've I've had a pet gecko for like the last ten years. When I met my wife, she had a pet gecko, and that's when I guess, oh, okay, I guess I guess this is it. This has been my username forever. And then we got another gecko together, and so when we uh, when we were working on Star Trek, I said, I can't wait to. I want a Saurian. Make the Saurians are getting the game. I want to play a Saurian, so I made sure Saurians were in. And and if you if for those who pay attention to the to the twenty four oh nine and on and all the lore. The president of the Federation is a it's, Saurian, yeah, and his yeah. name. And you know what his name is? Does anybody know his name? His oh. name is his, his name is Okeg. It's a gecko right. spelled backwards. So, oh. so that's that was my that was that was my self indulgence into the Star Trek <laughs> universe. So. And he does actually appear in a uh, mission presently right now too. Rise of Darkness, Part Two, I believe. Uh -huh. Somebody has actually put. The Federation president in there. Fantastic. I, I uh, certainly know. Rise of Darkness. I, I got it. I got to play that one now. Rise mm -hmm. of Darkness. Uh, oh yes, Rise of Darkness one and two is an right. absolutely well, pretty I, mission, I, I, I and it played. has the Voth. And it has the Voth. Has the oh, the one with the Voth. Oh. It's the yeah. one with the Voth. Yeah, we we uh, we we. I very much want to um, have the Voth. I want a, mm. a Delta Quadrant expansion with with about Delta having all Delta Quadrant species. And having the Voth be the main, the main, uh, the main adversary in there. I've talked about that before. And uh, flying inside a giant city ship. And I know somebody's got a. Uh, and maybe this is the series that you're talking about. I know someone has a has a beaten us to the punch a little bit as far as being able to fly inside a city ship. I've mm. heard. Maybe it's maybe it's that 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 series you mentioned. But that's what I've always I've wanted to see. And it would be. And we have like Saurian and Gorn storylines inter integrated in between there because you know the. The Voth hate those mammalian species and think Saurian species are superior. So um, who knows what we'll do with that? So we also hear you're uh, you're big into birds. Uh, we're, we're, we've been asked to uh, ask what the uh, airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow is. Yeah. European, of course. An African or European? European. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, I have I have uh, five parrots and two cockatiels. Yes, I. I have I have a lot oh of birds. I have more than more than I more than I can handle. But it became at one point it was a hobby, and, and then it became a bad habit. But uh, does that mean we're yeah. going to get an avian species in the game? I've 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 talked about <laughs> bringing back the Zindi avians. Um, mm. At that one point, I I uh, there's no reason why they wouldn't show up. So we don't have all we don't have the Zindi in the game yet, other than in the bridge off, other than the duty officer system. Mm. So. Uh, um, I think that would be neat to release the the Zindi species as a whole 
Um, maybe put an event around it and and release some and do have to do something to get it to so to unlock the avian species. But we can't add flying to the games, unfortunately. So um, you know, obviously our engine can support flying because you know it's a superhero engine. Uh, at least it's you know it's it's got its roots in superhero technology. But our maps are not designed to handle it. Right, no. you fly up and then you could just fly outside the world. Unlike unlike <laughs> like Champions, where the uh, it's designed to, you know that you can fly and not mm. and not not break the map. So um, we wouldn't be able to do that. I don't know. We'll have some. I mean, Cation's caused enough trouble just being able to jump a little bit higher. <laughs> <laughs> So, 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 if we ever had the avians uh, in in there, they probably would would unlikely be a playable species. But you know, I wouldn't well, have a problem. Be more like ostriches, and they can't really fly. They can just well, we, the avians, the Zindi avians, did fly. I mean, yes. that's that was established. So they couldn't be they couldn't be them. So mm-hmm. it would either be a different offshoot or something, um, or a, a descendant. You know, maybe like a lost tribe of avians, like like the like the Romulans who've lost her. You know, the Romulans offshoot from Vulcan, so they've lost her, their ability to fly. That might be an interesting story. There, I just made one up. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> so Five get stars. into the foundry here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've got one last question, um, which I yes. don't know whether you'll be able to do anything about it or not. I'll try. But, uh, demo record. Yeah, you're. Uh, whatever you're going to ask, you're going to ask the wrong person. You can try. I'll, I'll do. But I know. I I know nothing about that. That's an entirely engineering driven tool. So what what is um, is there something that's that's broken that you're hoping to get out of it? Or because I can. Cert- I'm happy to uh, to to uh, to. Uh, it's breaking to more every feedback. day. Yeah, it seems oh, it? to be breaking down. Okay. A lot more than it used to. Um, it's just had general problems for a while. And then the past couple of days, actually, it kind of happened around the same time as the Foundry had its blip with mm. the um, the database. So in the last few patches, it's just got worse, unfortunately. So it, things aren't showing up. I mean, we can't show... Uh, the the biggest problem for a lot of people at the moment is um, that you can't show... Uh, like, if you record uh, custom-made NPCs in the Foundry, they won't show up in demos. Do you, you, they can't, you can't make any alien gen, any custom made species. Fascinating. What happens? Does it crash or they just don't show up or there's no head yeah, or what? Just oh. Yeah, oh, they're just invisible. Oh, they're just, just completely yeah. invisible. Yeah. yeah. So when, when you've made them in the foundry, they appear fine when they're in the foundry and you're playing through it. But then when you take a demo of them um, and you play it back, they, it's like they don't exist. So, um, all right. Well, I'm actually so jotting down some notes. I always make good information when I chat to the, uh, when I chat to the, the podcasts. The last one I talked to, there's no anti-proton split beam apparently in the in the Borg mm-hmm. store. <laughs> so I got that other note too. Um, I'll try to to see what I can what I can pass on. Pass Thank on. You. So we feel if we poke enough people, yeah. eventually it might it'll it will speed up. <laughs> yeah. So all right, I got my little post-it here, and I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll see I'll. Uh, I don't know anything about that. I'll mm-hmm. just have to just write up. I'll just write up a bug and send it to the software team, and hopefully something. something I mean, lovely. That. Thank you. Goes into a little black hole at this point, but I'll do, <laughs> I'll do my best. I'm sure they're swamped. Yes, yeah, it's it's, it's everybody is swamped. It's always swamped. There's always there's, there's no shortage, and it's a challenging thing to run an MMO, right? Because you've always mm-hmm. got there's always things you want to improve. There's always new things that break, and there's always new stuff you want to add, and that's just. And so uh, you just try to stay on top of it as much as you can. Just make sure you schedule enough fun stuff. Because I can remember, I'm always watching the boards. It's like, why has this bug been in here forever? And the next post is, when am I going to get? When am I going to get out of this this content drought? And it's like, well, do both of those. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then when they'll say that you have a content drought the day yeah. after new content's release. Yes, that's yes. That was that was that was lovely. That was like two yeah. days after the last featured episode. Back to the content drought. It's like, oh, all right. Well, it, I mean, that was for instance when we when we were accused of having a content content drought. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, uh, during you know before during the the few months up until. Um, up up until the release of of a uh, free to play. Well, the reason mm. why is because we were all focused not only on all just the, the huge features of of free to play, but just trying to get the game as polished as possible. Yeah. So all those old players that you know the veterans that wanted new content, and you know I, I felt for them. I wanted new content too. Mm-hmm. Um, they 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 were playing end game content. A lot of them weren't seeing all the new polishes and stuff that we were doing again because we need to make sure the game mm. was as polished and as stable as possible for all the new you know thousands of new players that were coming in so you know every time we have a schedule it's like what are we going to focus on and that's always that's such a challenge you know because he's like yeah you know we can't do that 
and we just can't do that this time, so that's too mm. bad, but we're going to do this, right? We're focusing all on fleets right now. That means no featured episode because everybody's working on, 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 the, uh, on the fleet system. But there's lots of content there, so you can count on that. Just, mm. it'll just, but it'll be a different type of content. So. Well, well I, I just started doing a, a playthrough set of videos with a, a friend of mine who's a, a free-to-player. We just rolled new new tunes. My gosh, the, the changes when you think it, back to, to season it's one. It's so different. It's, I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. It's, it's a so completely different. different game. Just it's just a tutorial alone, and then the experience oh, yeah. of playing from the ground up, playing in shooter mode, and playing it, and just it's uh, amazing. And all the you know, yeah, it's very it's very different. I wish we could have done more. I really wanted mm. to remaster so much more of the beginning episodes. I still wanted to get remastered, get the yeah. uh, uh, um, city on the edge of never, and add some mm. cut scenes to that. That, by the when way, it, would be the, the would be the one feature I would love to see added personally. Because I know you guys talk about that the feature. I would love to see added to the Foundry is the ability for players to make cutscenes and just integrate yeah. those. So, um, I think that's everything that we have. Um, oh, I, oh, hold on! I just got one more one more thing through. Okay, um, Kestrel would write up a number of, uh, of mission descriptions, short things that then Foundry authors would go and take and write and make missions around, uh, and then someone, be it cryptic or uh, community, could go along and say, "I like we like vote on these. We like this mission the best." So that then becomes the mission for that uh, Foundry for that cryptic mission kind of thing. And that sure. creates a, a leveling content, if that makes sense. I, I, I think I, I think I, I get what you're saying, um, mm-hmm. and I hadn't hadn't really th- thought about anything like that. Now, uh, certainly, you know, we we we've talked about how we want to have more featured featured foundry, uh, um, you know, featured spotlights, and and, and mm-hmm. have that integrated right onto the uh, you know the landing page for the uh, the mission page. Uh, um, and I think that will that should become just as viable of a way and an easy way for players to level up and be able to experience content just as much as they would choose to play one of our featured episodes or playing exploration or play PvP. So I, I, I think that as we develop that more, and that's the first step, right? Yeah. So you're on you're on step you're on step twelve. So we're, we're still <laughs> step, so so we're on step one. Let's we want to get that in there to to, to make mm-hmm. that work. And, uh, you know, at first it'll probably be like one or two featured episodes of the week, but maybe, you know, as we build that, that, that roster, we can say, you know, go back and play an older featured episode, perhaps, you know, maybe it'll be drop down, maybe we'll rotate them out. I, I don't know yet what we'll do with those. Um, as far as, uh, filling in the, the Klingon content, I think we'll have to see how, how a featured spotlight works out mm-hmm. and see whether or not people, you know, you, know, you and I and you guys are, are, are you know right there on the cutting edge of, of foundry and so but not every player is is experiencing it the same way that that you or I are um, because mm-hmm. for the most time most casual players will, will probably just play through the featured episodes um, and just you know play play the story that we've outlined and as they become more hardcore players and end game players and, and start looking for new content then they'll start playing more foundry stuff but if we are able to put it more in the spotlights right in the front we can maybe start getting more, more to play that. And if it starts to catch, then hey, maybe that's the way that we finish out the Klingon content because mm-hmm. we don't have enough Klingon content for level twenty, but we have a good amount. So we could probably take. Maybe we could, if that if that works, we could take. And again, here we go, brainstorming again. Right, <laughs> this, is not, this is not our current plan. Gecko didn't promise this, but uh, but we could. You know, I could see us taking all the Klingon stories, making a few more. And then mm-hmm. re-leveling the content when you play things as a Klingon, right? So re-leveling things out, you'd, we'd bump down the, you know, the, the, the Romulan arc and for them and, and then we could fill it in with go, you know, with more foundry episodes that are just Klingon only foundry episodes mm. once we have a slot. Uh, so, so that's an interesting idea to, to do that might be, you know, might be the fastest way for us to get a, a, a complete uh, a complete story arc for them, because mm. then we could we could fill in the gap. We could make the, we would make the tutorial right, and we'd make yeah. we'd make the beginning missions. Um, you know, we'd move house uh, Martok farms, or I call them Martok farms. We move that to the beginning, um, mm-hmm. and, and and the uh, the, the tour of the first city we, that would all move down there, and then but it, it, we would have to make sure that it's that it's robust enough that it could support that, and that players really enjoy it, mm. and it's solid so we'll just have to see as far as how it goes when we first release the changes and then 
going to step 12 where they're not supporting a whole new faction of that, <laughs> like the entire Romulan faction that's entirely UGC driven. Um, I wouldn't that would even be amazing. To, I wouldn't even <laughs> guess to speculate whether or not that'd be possible or feasible or if would even, you know, would it, would it work? Oh, gosh, so, yeah. I mean, the bottom line is, is that it sounds really easy to just say, we're just going to, you know, why can't we just get a guy in there and, 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 and send out uh, a request to make everybody make all these missions and we'll be mm. the best. But you know what? It's a lot of work. It, it is. <laughs> and it's a lot of work to review when you deal. I yeah. mean, the enterprise contest is a great example about, um, oh, I think it was great and I'm so glad we did it. And it was, and we got a great ship out of it. Yeah. But man, that is so hard logistically to kind of work, to work with the community and to, to, to just, to just get that done. You've got, you got a lot of entries to sort through. It's a lot of manpower to sort through. And it's a lot of hurt feelings and a lot of a lot of strong emotions about it. Then you've got but just the legal issues and IP rights issues and it's not it's it's a it's a simple it's a simple task that all of a sudden becomes really scary to do. And yeah. uh, companies don't don't like doing that too much. It's a, uh, you know, it's I kinda remember back in the old Ultima online days about they had community moderators that were I forgot what they used to call them but they they were volunteers that helped new players and then then one of them or some of them decided to sue or, uh, origins to, because they were hey we're doing customer service job we should get paid mm. and mm-hmm. so it's like oh it gets you know it was it came legal from a issues. volunteer moderator until it became a legal issue and mm. so companies get a little, little shy and a little scared when it starts talking about those things so be, and and besides that, it still becomes logistically uh, challenging. But yes. you know, I think we've built a good foundation with the foundry, and the community has built a tremendous foundation with fantastic missions. And it's time to really, it's time to leverage them, and it's time to really get uh, uh, get that uh, you know get that in the spotlight. And uh, let's we'll see how that goes. And I'm see, feeling some stuff is going to be coming to fruition rather soon on that front. Yeah, and we'll see where yeah. it takes us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that concludes our three-part interview with Captain Gecko, Al Rivera. We thank him for volunteering his time and for his candor. We interrupt with breaking news. We have information developing that Foundry slot purchases are currently not working. While I cannot confirm that this is a truly global issue, I can confirm that it has been occurring for multiple players. We will follow this story as it develops. Cryptic is aware of the issue, but we do not have an ETA at the moment on when this will be resolved. Thank you, and we return you to your regularly scheduled programming. It's me again, Crazy Chalaski, and have I got some deals for you. This is my wildest sale ever. You had the best, now try the rest. You don't have to spend bars of your Latinum when strips will get you the finest used slaves this side of Regulus. Sure, these babies have a little mileage on them, but one man's trash is another man's treasure. Am I right? Yes, I am, because Crazy Chalaski's got deals that are just plain lunacy. I've got green ones, white ones, blue ones. I can't even name all the shapes and styles I'm offering you at absolutely nutty rock-bottom prices. I'm crazy, crazy, crazy Chalaski, and if you're in the market for a pre-owned harlot, I've got her in my inventory. Take old Jamunga here. She can cough up a bucket of Dovamite phlegm all day, but it completely clears up by nightfall. That's when you really need her anyway, am I right? Of course I am, and she's just eight strips. Go ahead and say it. Chalaski is crazy. Look at Valme. She has absolutely no visible scarring, and she can be coherent for almost 90 minutes at a time. That's plenty if you know what I'm talking about. And this scratch and dead strumpet will only set you back six strips. Okay, five strips. I must be out of my mind. Of course I am. I'm crazy Chalaski. Now, Gallus here has only had a single owner. That's right, just one owner. Since he died of some strange alien virus, you can get this sweetie for a song. Literally. Come down and sing to me and she's all yours. Why you ask? Because I'm Crazy Chalaski. That's right, Crazy, Crazy, Crazy Chalaski. And my prices are insane! Crazy Chalaski is not responsible for any defects or medical anomalies, nor is he liable for any damages after purchase. And remember, all sales are final, no returns accepted. Just waiting on Rogue. Hey, what do you say we go take these EVA suits off before we do the interview? This being Primetime UGC's 10th episode, and a milestone, considering I never imagined having done this many so quickly, we have invited back onto our show the man who co-created it. 
we'd like to welcome former co-host, Foundry author of The Most Played Mission in the Foundry Community, and all-around great guy, Rogue Enterprise. All right, I'm going to start out with a tough one right off the bat, so the interview will get easier from here. <laughs> do you miss me? I mean, <laughs> do you miss co-hosting primetime? I miss prime time and I miss bite size. It was a uh, it was a really great time, uh, you know, getting those shows off the ground. So I do miss it, yes, extremely. And you, by extension, of course. No, thank you. <laughs> oh, good. I was afraid that I was probably going to get kicked to the curb. Ever. All right. Well, how about a uh, a real one? How long have you played STO, and when did you take an interest in the foundry? Uh, so I started playing uh, sometime in closed beta. I managed to get a closed beta invite. So I've been playing for quite some time. As far as the, as far as the Foundry goes, I, I didn't actually touch it on Tribble, but I but once it came out to Holodeck, uh, I started playing with it. Um, and it started out with you know an extremely simple, you know, extremely simple mission that you know was <laughs> extremely simplistic. Now that I think about it, but but it was enough to get me started. So, so pretty much since it's been out on holodeck. What is your favorite series or the one which most inspires you? I'm very much a Next Generation fan, so uh, I kind of grew up on that show uh, in grade school, so I started watching it uh, then. And from there, it's kind of branched out to all the different series, so I, I really love all of them, but really Next Gen is the, is the clear favorite. Are you more a Star Trek fan or a gamer? Uh, I'm kind of equal parts both, so I'm you know very heavy Star Trek fan since I was a little kid, but also also a gamer. I, my first gaming system, I sadly I'm not as hardcore as most of the other people out there. I started off with an NES, uh, so I was very much a Nintendo gamer in my youth. But mm-hmm. since then, it's been you know I had an Apple IIgs, GS and I had a, a you know a 486. So I've been been gaming it up since then own all the major consoles so i try to i try to do equal you know equal opportunity gaming but sto and foundry mission making takes up a fairly disproportionate amount of my uh you know gaming time it's been said on a recent podcast that you usually build your missions around a new tech trick that you've discovered how do you respond to that it it may not necessarily be a, a technical trick so it's 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 what i like to call a hook so i'll what generally my mission construction uh, techniques uh, go in such a way that I will sort of think of a of a hook or an idea to base my mission around first, and then I kind of just build the rest the rest of the mission around that. So, so a good example of that is the is my most popular mission, um, first cause and effect, which is kind of an homage to cause and effect in you know TNG episode. Right. So, so there I I you know I was you know thinking of what to do for our next Foundry mission. And I'm like, you know, I really love this episode. Um, how can I blow up the player and get away with it? And so they're just kind of, I mean, that was the hook for that mission. So from then I just, I just built out the rest of it. And, and you know, the rest is history, I guess. And that was going to be, I guess, partly my question is where you get the ideas to do the mission, such as first cause and effect, or even uh, war and queue which has us revisiting numerous flashpoints during recent Federation history. So, yeah, I mean, like, you know, First Cause and Effect is, is you know, pretty much directly inspired by, uh, you know, the TNG episode. Warren Q, uh, or, uh, you know, any of the, the key missions that, that I've done are, you know, very, you know, based on any time the Q's appeared. So, I mean, that one in particular where you kind of visit through, uh, you know, different points in the Federation's history. So, that was kind of a like a side uh, note to that mission, um, pretty much because I wanted to find out a way in which I could have a lot of combat in the mission, but have it make sense. Uh, I you know I think uh, Zondi did that really well in in Not Our War, so I was actually a little bit jealous. <laughs> I wanted to find out a way of executing that um, in a way that made sense. So you know a little bit of credit to him for kind of helping me jumpstart that idea too. Jealousy is a great motivator for most it, of it us. It is indeed. It is indeed. It's it started. In fact, uh, one of you know one of my favorite early missions um, is you know Captain Ravo's Worst of Both Worlds, um, and he, I mean, he did you know a, a ton to help 
inspire me. Because when I play that mission, I mean, that mission's been out since almost the beginning of the Foundry. So when I started, when you know, I when I got through that one, and I was like, oh my god, this is awesome, and I have to figure out how to do cool stuff like this. A lot of credit, a lot of credit. There's some tremendous ones out there. I mean, Alamac right now is enjoying a lot of popularity with his new one, and he's being recognized for his last one. He's doing well. Uh, that leads me to this question. Uh, apart from the obvious modest answer that the mission was on the top of the list, why do you think first cause and effect has been so astonishingly popular? <laughs> you know, it's kind of a it's kind of a combination of different factors. I mean, hopefully the mission's good. <laughs> I hope it's I hope it's because the mission is actually good. Um, but I think I think the hook for that mission is very good. Um, I think. Uh, it's it's actually kind of my fault that the mission description doesn't really le- uh you know hint as to what's going to happen in that in that mission. I kind of leave it very ambiguous. So when most people get to the hook of that mission, which is the you know I kill the player for mi- uh, mission advancement, they're very surprised. So I think that probably helps to the success of that mission. Um, but I think also uh, part of the reason of for its success is the kind of not so skill related. Uh, reason <laughs> because uh, I think during the season four uh, excitement with the Foundry, where a lot of missions were broken, I think First Cause and Effect lived through that. So, um, and it was one of the highest rated missions that lived through that. So it actually got a lot of fame and, and reputation during that time. Well, nice, congratulations. Now, uh, this may be pretty obvious by now, but story, pew pew, or balance? Uh, <laughs> I think it's usually balance. Um, I. I, I I think that a good mission has some has some combat in it, so I don't I don't think I'm technically capable of executing a good non combat mission. <laughs> I just don't know if it's it's just not my thing. So I, I like to have a lot of you know a lot of balance, just enough talking to keep the player interested, um, and then some combat to go along with that. Are there any special Easter eggs or um, bonuses that players should be hunting for throughout the mission? Uh, yeah, actually, um, I have a, a couple of recurring characters um, in some of my missions, um, and it's not just the female Q who is in both of my Q missions, but um, in several of them, I have uh, I have Captain Miami, who is a uh, I don't think it's ever mentioned in any of the missions, but she's uh, she's half Bajoran, half Vulcan, very interesting species combination. But that is actually my the uh, the character my girlfriend uses in the in the actual STO, so. I kind of have a running little Easter egg where I I try to include her uh, in all my missions in some way or another. So some ways more more minor, some ways more major, but it's just something I like to throw in there just just for fun. Yeah, it's a little tribute. Yes. Quite understandable. One thing, and I'll throw this one out there. You obviously played a few missions with your uh, co-hosting with Paul previously between Bite Sized and also Prime Time of. All the missions that you've played, and you can include your own in this, what has been your favorite mission? Oh, that's a good question. I think that that the Captain Rainbow mission I mentioned earlier, the um, Force of Both Worlds, it was a really good early inspirer for me. Um, but since then, I think I think Alamac has done a really awesome job. Um, with map construction, especially, uh, he can do things that I, I can only dream about doing. <laughs> essentially, yeah, I don't think you uh, have the time. I don't think most of us do. I don't know how yeah. he does that. It's patience. I think he uses a calculator and a protractor. <laughs> I think that's I think that's the trick. And I just don't have the patience. I eyeball all of my maps. <laughs> I just say, ah, oh, yeah, you know, that looks good. I'll just leave that there. But I, I think he actually does, you know, math. And I hate math. Yeah, so do I. I I'm with you on that. <laughs> but I think I think ultimately, like a lot of authors, have a lot of different strengths. Um, it's really difficult to pick just one, but yeah. But a lot of people have you know have their strengths. Like you know, Alan Mack has his map construction, and and Captain Ray was a really good inspirer. Um, but yeah, but every, every author kind of has their own strengths. Everybody's got a style. It's true. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely true. Another question I would have for me, having worked, I'll say, both sides of the table as a creator and a reviewer, what tip do you have to an aspiring Foundry author for getting 
into the game, be it a technical thing or a writing suggestion or whatever. That any new user needs to, I mean, at least if they're going to be, if they're going to be a Foundry author specifically, um, they, they can't do it for fame or recognition necessarily because it's just too easy to get your missions, you know, one star trolled, you know, right off the bat. So you have to do it for you. That's that's the big key point about about you know about making like an actual foundry mission is do it for your own benefit. I know every pretty much every author that gets asked a question like this will have the same response, and I, and it's totally it's totally legitimate. So yeah. so if you're making a foundry mission, do it for you. Uh, do it for your own benefit. If it's you know if it's you get a lot of dilithium tips for it, or you know it gets a lot of good reviews. I mean that's kind of a secondary concern because just because I mean pretty much only because you can get controlled so easily with the current review system. Yeah. Well, that's why I always ask that one question. It was on my list. Who do you write your missions for? I ask it to every <laughs> author. And surprisingly enough, there have only been two in 10 episodes that didn't answer almost exactly the way you did. Yeah. And, and I totally would answer true, it no. if asked. I would answer it the same way. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. How about what's next? Uh, what's next? So I have a mission in development. So this is, uh, you know, I, I took kind of a long break after uh, Warren Q. I kind of, I kind of feel like, you know, the the amount of work required to put out a mission is so great that you kind of have to take a break after it because it's <laughs> it's an exhausting experience. Um, but I do have one in development. Um, what can I say about it without giving away too much? It's it starts off at uh, at Starfleet Academy, and uh, the, the working title I have for it right now is Learning Curve. But that's it so far. <laughs> It's very much an in-progress right now. What addition to the Foundry would you like to see made in order to tell your stories more broadly? Well, ultimately, I I don't know. I mean, in my opinion, like, you know, any author that says, you know, oh, I, I need this one feature in order to, you know, execute my mission is, I mean, basically they just, they I, they're just using it as an excuse. I mean, just, I mean, there's ways to do pretty much whatever you want to do in the Foundry. It's not, I mean, may not, maybe not as, you know, as smoothly or as, as, you know, as effectively as you might want, but, but it, it is, a, I mean, it, it's usually totally doable. But that being said, there are things that they could do to improve the, you know, the Foundry that would make things easier for us. So, I mean, I have a, I have a list of feedback uh, that I, you know, hope they would take to heart, but, I mean, it's but it's basically a bunch of of little things. So, as you as you guys as authors probably well know, something like the you know, just pops into my head the uh, the idle animations. You can't use the spawn animations. So, something that I would love is having a difference between a uh, spawn animation and an idle animation. So, like for example, you could have a group of ships warp in uh, as their spawn animation instead of just appearing, um, and then not have it repeat over and over because. That's what happens when you set it as an idle animation right now. That's probably one of the biggest things because, you know, a lot, you know, especially in you know, space maps, you have, you know, oh, ships, you know, have come to the rescue and they have to warp in, not just appear in front of your face. So. so basically you hear that first, ladies and gentlemen, when you go on your forum flaming, it's Rogue's fault. <laughs> I'm totally comfortable with that. <laughs> Please blame me. <laughs> I think we've all got a list. I mean, just just the fact that like you said, there you know, a lot of it is excuse, but some things, some people have you know this dream in mind that they're going to make this TOS era mission, and they cannot proceed sure. until they have the assets to do it. I mean, in a situation like that, I can understand. But yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I think I haven't run into that because I I like making the like the twenty four oh nine era missions, I guess, but. But I can I can totally understand. I mean, more assets are always greater. <laughs> so I mean, you can of course you can always recompile the current currently existing assets in fun and exciting ways, like Alan Mack has done mm. uh, very effectively. But but yeah, I totally agree. More assets. Who can who can argue with more assets? So more, 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 more. <laughs> I like the more. Yes, for sure. Rogue, we'd like to thank you for sparing the time to come in and chat with us on Primetime UGC. You're welcome anytime. Absolutely. I, I miss uh, miss hanging out with you guys. I miss putting the show together. So thank you for having me on. And thank you for coming in.
And now, news from around the sector. Since my last report, Dan Stahl was interviewed by 12th Fleet, and of course we've had our interview series with Captain Gecko, and the penned in primetime spotlight with Cryptic Kestrel. Priority One interviewed C. Dodds, a content designer, in his first interview with the public, and we also saw the release of the final Massively article featuring Terry Lynn with her interview of Cryptic Kestrel. Brandflakes was on podcast UGC announcing the return of the Foundry Spotlight as well as ramping everything up for May being the month of Foundry features. Subspace Radio interviewed Mapolis, one of the Foundry creators, and Stoked also featured an interview with Gozer. We've talked about where you came up with the ideas. Where did you start writing it? Though? Where in the mission did you start writing it from? I'm curious. Did you did you start writing from, uh, say, the like at the city, or did you write it linearly? Did you go everywhere, which way, doing things at one by one, piecemeal? How, how did it all come together? And I'd like to hear Christine's answer to that question as well. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how I did it. I um. <laughs> I always write in Word rather than in the Foundry editor. I just couldn't do it in the little dialogue boxes in the editor. So I, I do write in a Word document. And the first thing I always write is the summary, uh, just the, the paragraph that the player will see when they're scrolling through the list of various missions and deciding whether to pick it or not, because that kind of sets the scene. And then I write a rough plan, just an outline of the maps, so I kind of know where it's going to go. And then I write it more or less in a completely linear fashion from, from start to finish, except that very often the, the best bits of inspiration and the best lines of dialogue will strike at random moments when I'm off doing other things or when I'm yeah. at work or whatever. So um, I will sit and write them just a few lines or a paragraph in my phone or something and just capture that. And then I'll go and paste it into the Word doc and leave it there for later. So it might be that the, the final paragraph of the mission, the final words get written quite early and I just stick them in there and then I write all the stuff that leads up to it. So capture good ideas when they strike, obviously, because no good idea should ever go to waste. Stick okay. them in there and then just, just carry on sort of writing up it in a linear fashion. But the Probably thing... One of my ideas, sorry to interrupt, just... Uh, go ahead. It, one of them came up uh, in the middle of my English, English exam last year. Hooray! Uh, right <laughs> in the middle. Like, talking about Shakespeare... <laughs> Talking about film, and then, oh, oh, I can kill someone in that way. I can make the warp core explode there, and that explains it. <laughs> so you, you you grab a piece of scratch paper, write it down, and keep on going. Oh, just the moral is: whenever an idea hits, just grab whatever you have, just type it into your phone as a text message, and send it to yourself, or write it on a, a receipt, or any just whatever you have, just write it down. Always got to grab those and hold on to them. But I have to say, the one thing uh, that I left to the end, really, I just procrastinated like crazy and put it off, put it off. Just writing the dialogue with the Palmery guy that you could talk to right in the middle of that city. Because uh, I knew that if the player was able to visit the city and not talk to the Palmery and not find out what they were about, that would be really disappointing. But I wasn't quite sure what they were about. <laughs> so I kind of had this notion that, you know, they'd invite everybody over to see the monster who did in 16 years, but I didn't know why. So I left it for a while, and I knew it had to be good, and I knew it had to pay off a really epic concept. And I was scared of writing that, because I thought, oh, how do I write this? How do I make this big enough to, to pay off all those huge maps and pay off the huge epic concept? And one day, I, I, just, I had my netbook there, and it was lunchtime, and I went down to the canteen. It was really busy and loud, and I sat on the table and just tapped it out in amongst all of that noise and, and hoopla. And um, it pretty much worked, and it got redrafted maybe once or twice after that. But um, there can be a, a key spot in a story that you put off writing, and then sooner or later you just bite the bullet and just bash it out, and then maybe redraft it a little bit. But, uh, yeah, that was tough, trying to like the Palmoli dialogues. Yeah, when I'm, work when I'm working on a mission, I 
will start with a very, very broad outline of a mission or even a sentence, you know. Alpha started with, you know, bird of prey crash landed in, dr in jungle, then there's Herogen. And then I go from that and to make a, a sort of point by point outline of the major points I want to happen, what I want to see, who the characters are, that sort of thing. And because it's a very collaborative process here, at that point, it's going to go to, you know, Scott Chikoff or Goat Shark, as he is on the forums, who's our lead, and it's going to go to Gecko, and it's going to go to Destal, and we're going to talk about it and try to figure out, and, and whoever is actually designing the mission, and we're all going to sit down and talk about, you know, what people want to, see, you know, what we want to see, maybe there, maybe there should be a captive, blah, 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 that sort of thing. Then, you know, if I need to define any new characters, anybody who's very important to the mission, like when I was inventing Obasek or inventing the Enterprise F crew or such, that may be, you know, just short outlines to, or character sketches to help me get an idea of how they talk, how they sound. By that point, the mission's probably in production, so I'm getting to see it put together by the designer, and we're having multiple playthroughs as things go on, just to check away and see how things are working and what's working, what's not working, what we can make better, things like that. And all along the way, I'm thinking, okay, well, I can use this line or that line, and it's a lot like he was saying, you know, you can be in the car or in the shower or watching TV or it's in the middle of the night, you know, and you just wake, you know, realize, okay, I can do, say this, and you just grab a piece of paper or my note, netbook or whatever and write it down and bring it in. And then most of the time I write directly into the editors. So uh, that's a little odd, especially when I go back and start writing paragraphs for something else. And I'm still typing BRBR BR at the end of par every paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's more playtesting and we, yeah. Uh, kind of go through it in that way and polish until it finally makes it with its way out. And anything that's voiced along the way, I'm, I've got to make sure those are done early enough so that we can get the scripts, which is really an Excel spreadsheet with notes and things like that, over to audio, and then we can, you know, book actors and get everything recorded. Along those lines, I know that you were saying you were, you know, you do the outline and then you, you move forward from there. What would... I mean, I, and I'm going to ask again, both you, Ali, and and Christine, because you have such similar and yet divergent opinions or or perspectives of writing for different kinds of missions in the game. And that is, have you ever come across? Now, Christine, I'll ask you: Have you ever come across where somebody comes in later, a developer, or something, and says, "We really want to feature this new tech that we have available. You need to be able to write in for that." And in the same way, Ali, is it for you when you write something? Have you come across where you want to feature uh, a particular form of tech available to you in the foundry? And have you ever found yourself trying to write a way around it to, to feature that tech or to spice up your, your story or? Oh, absolutely. There have been times that, I, you know, they've said, we want to, we want to feature this kind of tech and so we, we need to work it in. Or, you know, a designer's got a great idea. I want to do X and it's really awesome, but we need to work it into the mission. And, you know, and that's something, and like I said, it's a collaborative process. And there's you other times, you know, I go into a mission thinking about, okay, well, we want to do this. And so what can I do that makes double duty? Like, for example, in the 2800, we wanted a new social zone. They wanted someplace, you know, another social area map. So that's why I set the second mission on Bajor. So not only do we use it as a mission map, we now have a new social zone, double duty. Yay. Um, so, you know. Along those lines, have you ever come across a situation where, the featuring of the new tech really throws a wrench into the story you wanted to tell. It's happened. Um, there, there have been, there are more dead drafts than you can imagine. Um, <laughs> but um, the thing about it being a video game as opposed to a novel or a TV show or any other major point of writing is that the gameplay is a major factor. Is a major factor of it, and right. a lot of it is okay. If you know, in some in some story in some games, I'm like, you know, if I want 100% story, I'll go read a book. You know, but if I want to play a video game, I want to play a video game. You have this sort of balance between story and gameplay. Uh, I always have to be cognizant that this is a game. What about you, Elemic? Well, again, I think it, it's such a good point about this being a, a video game rather than a book. So mm -hmm. there, there was a grand idea for, for Paul Marie, and that was just this being invited to go and visit them once every 200 years. But there were also some set pieces, just some action things that I wanted to include. Like, for example, there's a, a jump down a turbolift shaft. Um, that was awesome. I, yeah. Well, I, I thought that that would be awesome. I just had it as an idea. In fact, it, it, 
I, I think I had a dream years ago when I was a teenager of, of being in a Star Trek episode on an away team, and uh, the only way to escape some scene of peril was to jump off a cliff and then to be beamed up as as I sort of plummeted at some terminal velocity towards the ground, and I just had this vision of a long shot with a blue transporter streak sort of stretching down the you know the edge of the cliff. So I'd wanted to use that somehow for for a long time, and was determined to crowbar it into Palmeri somehow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it, it almost became like a tent pole, you know, and you string the story between these these poles, and that was one of them. Um, so I had the player go over to the Klingon ship to try and disable it to, to, to defeat their nasty plan, and the only way to escape was to was to jump down the turbo lift and beam out while you're in free fall. So it was, yeah, may, maybe that's not the best way to do it, is, is to have a, an idea for a set piece and then write the story to accommodate it. But I don't know, it, it means that it's not just a novel. It means that there's some nice action pieces in there as well, and that that probably is what makes it a video game. Yeah, I've worked in a very similar way before as well with my uh, with my missions. Like I said, I would quite often make a map just because I liked the idea of the map, and then I sit down and think, okay, now I've got this map. It does some cool stuff. How the hell does it actually fit into the mission? What do I do? Like, uh, I had this idea where I would um, trap. The, I knew I wanted to trap a player in this ship that was going to kill them and uh, there was radiation leaking everywhere and it would be the final sequence of this mission but I had no idea how on earth I was going to get from the middle of the mission to the end and yet I had this map already so I then worked the story around the map and I was wondering do do, do either of you do that? I, I suppose it would be a bit different for, for you to do that Christine but Ali, do you, do you, do you ever do that? I think the Arboretum actually was, was an example of that. Um, because we have these ships in STO that are basically like the Pasteur from all the things. But one of the variants, uh, has a transparent sphere on the front of it. Um, and I just thought, why? You know, what, what, what is that for? What could you put in there? And I also had this idea, you know, what if the Arboretum on TNG had actually looked good. Because <laughs> it looked pretty naff, okay? I mean, they had limited budget and so on. But what if they had an unlimited budget? And what if they could have put it in this great big glass dome with, you know, while the ship was at warp with the stars streaking overhead and a huge, a huge walkway through the middle of it with sort of glass walls and all the rest of it. So I tried, uh, it started building that map, first of all, to see if it would work. And it looked like it would. So I finished the map and then found a way to write it into the story and actually it's a bit of a silly map it's a complete folly because you beam over there and there's only one thing to do one objective and that is go and talk to the ambassador and that's it and that's just probably the worst state of affairs for any map to be in you know one objective that you could do anywhere else it effectively is a pointless map but it was you know it was an indulgence and it was so much fun to build and i thought it looked pretty good once it was finished um, and it's been pretty popular since. So, you know, it's a one objective map. It's pretty pointless, really, but it looks good and it was fun to build and it's a great idea. So I worked it in and why not? Usually I would hate going to one map just to do one thing. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a waste of time. It's a, it's a pointless map transfer and there. So I think, uh, complete one objective and then you beam out. But it kind of ticked enough boxes to make it actually have a point. I said, I'm thinking, actually, I quite like this, and I want to explore it, but unfortunately didn't have time, but I will go back and explore it, because I know there are Easter eggs there. Sorry. I saw, <laughs> I saw the consoles lit up, and I, wanted, I saw those, uh, there were bridges down over water, and this building off in the far distance, and I, just, uh, I want to go, I want to run around this place like a little child in a sweet shop. I want it. <laughs> this, is my, this is my map. I want it. Um, and that, that, that kind of feeling is the feeling I had while I was building it. Oh, and really, it. and really that is the point of that map because mm -hmm. it comes back to what I said earlier about where it's the difference between being a foundry author and being Kestrel because <laughs> the only, per the only person I'm trying to please when I work in a foundry is me. And I, I loved building that map. Mm -hmm. So that's why that map is there and that's, why it exists and that's the only reason it needs to be for that map to exist because I enjoyed it mm -hmm. um, but I have that privilege because I'm a foundry author not an STO dev and the only person I'm building these things for is me really. 
Christine, do you have, going back to my question before, have you ever had to... Uh... Well, you know, you're talking about, you know, trying to build content around specific locations or maps or things that you have. And I, we absolutely do that. And, you know, are there a couple specific examples I can give you. Um, first off, Coliseum was kind of came about that way. Um, because back in season two, season three, somewhere there, we were working on this mission and it was, it was supposed to be an Undine mission and it just didn't work. The story didn't work. The tech wasn't working. It was just, wasn't fun and it, it got canceled but the art for this really cool coliseum had been done and um it was always stuck in the back of my mind that you know i wanted to do something with that awesome map um so when we got around to writing the romulan series and i was like okay coliseum how am i going to work a coliseum into this <laughs> so, you know it, then it, and then ended up working out very well the vault is another thing like that um the vault we actually was kind of created for multiple reasons. One, to give the Remans a place to kind of call their own, as it were. Um, two, um, because I wanted to use it as almost like a tech test for another bit of content we actually haven't done yet, but are still planning, um, just to prove that you could do the big, you know, inside with a little ship flying around, that sort of thing. Um, and Jesse Heineck just did a, an amazing job with it, and, and the artist did an amazing job with it. And I was like, we got to go back to the vault. We got to, you know, we got to do something else with it. So now we have, you know, the shuttle event that just launched. Um, you know, the, we make some really awesome things, and there's a little bit of like, yeah, you make it once. It's not necessarily, you know, because of our kits and the way we build things, it's not necessarily that we're starting from scratch every single time. But um, yeah, those those things are always lingering around in the back of my mind. How can I go back to that awesome place? Well, that, the, the Colosseum map is is an awesome map. You know, the, mm-hmm. the, the, that, that arena with those big graboid worms coming out of the ground, and the only thing you have to fight them with is effectively a sharpened shovel. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> but that's, it's, the reason that that is so great is because it's so different to Agreed. anything else in this game. It's, well, not it's the least of which is you get you as a player get to play a mission that has the fight the quintessential fight music. Oh yes, come um, on. I, now, <laughs> we we worked for like, and, and that was mostly Gecko's doing, but we worked for like six months permission for that, and it just made it. I think there wasn't a person who, you know, a Trek fan who didn't totally appreciate that fact. I mean, we all may we all may want to punch Slamic Square in the face, but we'll fight. <laughs> as long as we get to fight to that music. Can I just go back to the, the, the fight music for Coliseum? Because I missed that the first time around because I, I play the game with the music switched off. Oh. Because I, I sometimes, or perhaps even often, find that the music as a, is at odds with the sentiment or the emotion in the writing, in the dialogue. Um, so that's why I have it switched off. Uh, and also, as a foundry author, the, the music is one thing that we cannot control. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, I just I just play with it off. That's a fair enough point. I I wish that we could control music. We, there's hints that when we get the uh, the cutscene tool, that we might be able to, to do more with that. Uh, in that we'll be able to use what is actually what's in what what's in the sound library um, already. We might be able to use that. So I, I know with cutscenes in the past, there have been a couple of little different sound cues here and there that are added to add to stuff here and there. But no, it, it's I, I understand what you mean, but still you missed up so much. Well, I did go back and play afterwards once I heard that that was the music. <laughs> so I replayed it just for the music. Yeah, and, and adding custom music to maps is something that's even a little tricky for us. Yes. We are getting more ways to do it, but it does, it adds a lot. You know, it, and audio is can make or break a story, you know, good audio, you know, you think about the audio and what lies beneath and such that, you know, really helps sell the story and helps sell the experience. When I played it Mm -hmm. for the first time, this sudden voice that just made me jump out of my skin is the polite way of putting it. Oh, it made me jump too, because Jesse Heineck, who was the designer on that mission, he got that recorded and he didn't tell me. (laughs) I I think you're talking Funny it was, kid. Oh no! It don't was do that. such a wonderful surprise. <laughs> <That's scary. laughs> this might be difficult to answer, but I, I just wanted to know how much do you take from your friends and your family and people you know to put into characters in the missions that you write? It really depends on the characters and 
the, you know, you're, uh, as a writer, you're always seeing people around you and you're always using them as a reference for things. But I don't want to, like, make a character that is, you know, my mom, for example, because one, that would be really strange. But two, you know, I, I think you write what you know, but you shouldn't write your life exactly because then you're losing kind of the fantasy aspect of it. So, you know, I'm always going to take elements and the turns of phrase and the, the way people act as inspiration, but I think eventually you have to kind of go your own way. Besides, my mom would never see her character. She just keeps asking me to work her cat's names into the game somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I have not done it yet. So you and Christopher Bennett have something in common. Yeah. <laughs> And for those of you who don't know, Christopher Bennett's an official Star Trek author, and it's my understanding he has worked his cat's names into several of his books. <laughs> yeah, I just keep telling, you know, Mom, I don't think we're going to make a Vulcan name lucky. I just don't. <laughs> Do I think, Kestrel, that you want to say to anyone? The Foundry itself, like I said, the Foundry has just got such amazing freedom. I always am continually impressed by the things I see people make. And keep getting in there and keep making your own stories. Add to Star Trek. One very quick question before we, before we end. Do you play uh, Foundry missions often, as often as you'd like? or uh, like Not as often as I like, because um, just the amount of free time I have is limited. I do play them. If you send me an email or something saying, please play my mission, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do that, just because I get a lot of those. But I try to, especially if there's a mission that everyone's talking about, oh, this is really great, this is really good, you know. Yeah, I'm probably going to go check it out at some point because I want to see the good stuff too. And, you know, we're going to be, I think, you know, and this is more of a Brandon or a Brand Flakes thing and he's kind of driving it, but Foundry Spotlights are coming back. So we're going to be able to put a spotlight on some of those missions again and hopefully getting them out to the wider audience overall. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll play every one of those. Well, this was fun, guys, and I hope we can sit down and do it again sometime. Uh, I think we've got some really good stuff. Uh, so, if you'd all like to say goodbye, and uh, we'll see you all later. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Keep playing. I'm Crazy Chalaski, and I'm back with Chalaski's Choice. This week's special is a fine maiden named Alamar. She was owned by a pejorian expatriate who she only rode before Temple on Sundays. High mileage? Yes, but well-maintained, as you can see. Today and today only, don't let this crazy deal pass you by. I'm asking four strips down from five. That is an amazingly demented deal. Her accessories alone are worth that. How can I do it, you ask? I'll tell you how. I'm crazy! That's right, I'm Crazy Chalaski. So come down and pick her up. Time's running out. Better yet. The first offer of four strips gets free delivery. Did you hear me? Free. It's insanity, I tell you. Severe mental disorder, the likes of which cannot be measured with any known technology. Because I'm crazy Chalaski and my prices are insane. There are no new bugs to report this week, as so far it seems that only currently known issues are floating around, though, and I have not been able to confirm this with anyone else, I have noticed that potentially some of the dust effects in-game are no longer working correctly. As far as feature requests this week, I'm going to return to an old favorite that has been mentioned on numerous occasions, the ability to feature new missions in-game. Something I've noticed, and this is partly because of the return of the Foundry Feature Spotlight, is that Ally Mac 30 has gotten a great many of new playthroughs of his mission. As stated earlier, he's had approximately 2,500 playthroughs since the Foundry Spotlight was announced on Friday. Now that's approximately a span, as of this recording, of over 24 hours. It was figured, potentially, initially, that he was getting a new playthrough every minute. If this is the case, this is a wonderful boon for Foundry authors, but right now it's only featured on one author. A mechanic change or something needs to be done to the Foundry spotlight itself. Not necessarily the spotlight of one user, but the new mission or the community author tab needs to be modified so that more authors can get more exposure and we don't end up with just one player constantly getting a bunch of playthroughs and be trapped where other authors languish because they are not acquainted with people 
in order to get their mission out there and chosen as a spotlight mission. We can only hope that this will be addressed with some of the changes coming up and that the development team will communicate with the community in order to address these concerns. And that concludes Episode 10 of Primetime UGC. Published in Primetime will not be aired tonight due to the Avengers. Yes, I said the Avengers. Everybody went to the movies, so nobody made missions or wants to publicize. So, join us in two weeks for Episode 11. Hope you enjoyed it. Good night now.